Hi, y'all, and welcome to the Neuro NICU Virtual Workshop. My name is John Seegers, President of International Biomedical. During these challenging times, we are pleased to be able to provide educational content through new virtual platforms. Kathy Randall and our other expert presenters will be offering some insight today to help you in your careers as neuro NICU professionals. Kathy has had an interest in the subspecialty of neonatal neurology since her days as a bedside nurse. She has been an educator on fetal neonatal brain development, neuroprotective care, and neuro monitoring and assessment for the last 15 years. Her passion for this topic has taken her around the globe as an invited speaker and guest at a number of universities and conferences. I'd like to thank Kathy, Tim, Greg, Byrne, and Martina for their dedicated efforts and expertise in providing this content to you. And lastly, I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in today. Without your support, we could not make this happen. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kathy Randall, who will kick off our virtual event with her talk on using and interpreting AEEG. Thanks, John, and thanks to everybody for the invitation and to all of you who are watching live. It's really exciting to see you joining, um, to see all of your, um, your names I'm popping in. So um, just I invite you to make this as interactive as possible. I really do want it to be for you and about you and, and to give you some really practical um, tips for today. So I'm going to just quickly share my screen and um, then I'll go ahead and um, turn off my video for now, but I'll be back in just a few minutes um, for the Q&A as well. So, uh, so let's get started. So the title that I created for this talk is um, Five Clinical Hacks for Using AEEG. And I hope that many of you are already using it, but just in case this might be a new topic for you, I thought I'd give a little bit of background. So what exactly is AEEG? It's a simplified bedside tool that gives us as NICU clinicians the ability to have real-time trending right at the bedside. And it's all about the function, the electrical function of the baby's brain. And so we use this really to complement our other neuro assessments. It doesn't replace other things. It's a complement, a full complement. And I want you to really uh, appreciate that. We throw around this word AEG or CFM, cerebral function monitor. We throw them around, but what do they really, really mean? Um, they really um, stand for some pretty specific things. Um, and so I want to make sure that we all have an understanding um, of that as well. So first off, AEEG stands for Amplitude Integrated EEG. We use a baby A before the EEG to, to indicate amplitude integrated. We don't use a capital A because capital A actually means ambulatory EEG. And so that was already taken in the literature when this came around. And so we use the small a to designate the amplitude integrated part. It's not amplified EEG. It doesn't do really um, anything to make it bigger and louder and easier to read. It does trend it, which we'll talk about a lot. And it's definitely not anti EEG. We don't want to do AEEG and not do anything else. We still want to use our other tools that we have. So let's talk a little bit about these three words, amplitude, integrated, EEG. So amplitude is just the word we use that means that we're measuring a wave from the top to the bottom. And this applies to every kind of wave form, a sound wave, brain wave, California beach wave. And so these are um, just waves and measurements of waves. So there's not really any other features that, are, that we're looking at, although when you look at a full EEG, there are many features. We're really focused with amplitude integrated EEG on the amplitude or how strong are the brain waves. Then integrated means just to combine a lot of information into one, and that's really all about finding a trend. And so that integration is not necessarily a mathematical integration, but it's more of a trending integration. And then of course, EEG, which we're all familiar with, which is that graphical recording of brain activity that happens from electrodes that are placed on the baby's head, and these require expert interpretation, and they are complicated and require many years of training to become confident in using these. So how does AEEG really turn, or EEG turn into AEEG? Well, it goes through a series of steps, and we're not going to spend time on these steps. In a longer class, we, we would talk about them in more detail. But basically know that the machine does some calculations on the, on the actual raw EEG 
to then transform it into AEEG. And what I really want to make sure that you understand, because it really helps you to understand the patterns we're going to talk about here in a second, are that every 15 seconds, about, we kind of approximate every 15 seconds, the monitor looks for the maximum activity and the minimum activity. And it squishes this together and plots it one brush stroke at a time on a very fixed scale. And so one line at a time, which represents the max and min amplitude every 15 seconds, is, is brushed onto the screen one stroke at a time one at a time. So in the end, we end up with something that looks like the very bottom here. And if you can see my cursor, you can see that you have this um, band, this compressed band, compressed band on this very specific scale. And we have zero at the bottom, five, 10, and 100. And that's the scale that we're gonna use to interpret the AEEG. Along the bottom, we have time markings, and it's a very slow speed. It's what we call six centimeters an hour, or one centimeter every 10 minutes. And so this very slow speed slowly stacks these brush strokes 15 seconds at a time along on the paper. And now it's not even paper. It, back in the day, it was paper. Um, and so this is just to show you what AEG isn't. It's not a new tool. It's been around and being used in neonatal units um, since the 90s. It's not really a diagnostic tool, and I put in parentheses usually, because there are some places that only have AEEG, so they want to be sure that they're using it fully. And it's definitely not a replacement for that full EEG, which I mentioned before. And so let's now dig into what I'm calling the five hacks for you because I want to make sure that you feel comfortable using AEEG. So even if you don't think that the hacks are that helpful, I hope that you'll appreciate that I googled and found a zillion different fun little hacks and um, I've actually given you some life hacks along with your AEEG hacks just in case you're not digging the AEEG one. So First off, we're going to talk about the patterns. So the five basic patterns, and this should be reassuring to you if you've ever had to take ACLS or anything else, it's nice to know that for AEEG, there are only five patterns. And so I like to break it into when do we expect to see these kinds of patterns? When are they normal or expected patterns for different ages of babies? So we have one tracing that's normal if you're a term baby, one tracing that's normal if you're a preterm baby, and pretty much everything else is abnormal and you never want to see it. So let's talk about these patterns, these five patterns. So as I mentioned before, there is one for term babies. That's what we call continuous normal voltage. There's one for preterm babies. That's discontinuous normal voltage. And then we have the three abnormal, which are really for your sick babies. And it doesn't really matter if you're term or preterm, and it doesn't even really matter if you're a baby or an adult. These are never normal. These are not things that we should ever see. So let's dig a little bit into what makes the definition for these five patterns. So for the term baby, we want to look at the continuous normal voltage. And so how we define continuous normal voltage is we again look at the scale on the left hand side. We find that 0, 5, 10, 100. And for it to be a normal, continuous normal pattern, the upper edge, oops, sorry, the upper edge must be above 10 and the lower edge must be above 5. That's it. Above 10, above 5, continuous normal voltage. That's just looking at amplitude. Now we can dig in deeper and look for sleep and symmetry and a lot of other things, but just on the surface, we're looking at the background pattern. So above 10, above five, I'm a term baby. Yay, that's good. If I'm a preterm baby, I still want my upper edge to be above 10, same scale, 0, 5, 10, 100. My upper margin should still be above 10, but because I'm premature and my brain doesn't always, just like breathing, we kind of take pauses when the, when the baby takes pauses when they're breathing, the brain takes pauses. 
And so because of those pauses, the lower edge drifts downward and you can see sometimes it's below five. So what we have is upper margins above 10, lower margins below five, but this is expected for a preterm baby. If you were a term baby and you show me this pattern, that's not what I expect. That's not normal for your age. I need to go figure out why. So that's, that's the difference um, that we look at between normal and abnormal between term and preterm. Now I said there are three abnormal patterns and just for sake of time, I'm gonna briefly go through them, but I am gonna at the end give you a link to my ebook where I go through all of these and that way you can um, just take more time with it. So the abnormal tracings, the first one that we've probably all heard of is burst suppression. And this is a mixture of very high voltages called bursts and suppressed activity and long periods of suppressed activity. And so what we're looking at when we have this mixture of high and low voltages is a very wide AEEG. And so that AEEG is very high, very low. And what we're thinking of for burst suppression is you always want the upper margin to be at least 25 microvolts. So remember for normals, we're normally saying it has to be at least above 10. Well, to call it really a burst, it has to be above 25. So it's still the same scale. And we're just looking up here very high and very, very low. So there are other things that we can look into and Greg and Martina who are going to present after me are going to teach you a little bit more about that as well. So some of the other patterns that we want to be aware of are the low voltage where the upper margin is not even reaching 10 or in the cases of a flat trace where the bottom margin is upper and bottom margin are all really low and typically less than five. So when we kind of put them all together and we think about these names and these voltages, we can really zero in and we can say, if it's normal, it should be above 10 and above five. And if it's discontinuous, we're gonna have above 10, but below five. And then for burst suppression, above 25, but still below five. And then for low voltage, the upper margin less than 10, lower margins less than five and flat, 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 right? So you get the idea. So that's hack number one. You kind of have to know what's normal and what's abnormal. And then number two is to look for seizures. So as we looked at those patterns before, we saw kind of a, like a continuous pattern. But when we're looking for abnormalities, we're looking for disruptions in that. And so we look for these archways, we look for these very periods of high voltage that really clue us into um, there potentially being a seizure. So for me, what I'm looking for is a gradual increase and decrease in the upper and lower margin. You can see that it, be it forms almost like an archway when it, when it goes gradually up and gradually down. And so oftentimes we may have a pattern that looks okay. This time we have that upper margin is greater than 10, lower margin is greater than five. And if you're close to your chat, tell me which one you think this is. Which, which pattern is this? Chat it in. And would this be normal for that term baby or would this be normal for that preterm baby? And you can just chat right in and tell me what you think and I'll, I'll be looking out to see what you write. Um, so yeah, preterm, normal for preterm. Exactly, exactly, great. But then we came to the bedside and we started scrolling and we saw, oh my goodness, there's something more happening. There's this very unusual pattern, this archway. So this is suspicious. We think it could be seizures, but we don't know for, for sure if it's a seizure, unless we actually open up and look at the raw EEG. So I would invite you, if you have um, a monitor in your unit, to begin to you know, look at that. But, and what makes this really suspicious is the spike wave, spike wave, spike wave. It's very rhythmic. It's very high voltage. This makes it very high likelihood that this is a seizure. Now, can there be other things that are rhythmic in the NICU? You better believe it. And so we want to make sure that we're aware of artifacts. And um, Greg and Martina are going to share with you some of um, some ways that 
we can, can maybe identify these artifacts, minimize these artifacts, and make it easier for us to interpret right at the bedside. So there are many artifacts that we should be aware of. And so we need to always go back to the raw EEG, just like I did on this slide, and look and see whether or not it's rhythmic, whether or not it's continuous, it's happening and going on for 10 seconds or more, or whether or not it's just some movement, like somebody just mentioned. Yeah, it could be movement. It can also be padding. <laughs> pat, 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 mom's patting the baby. And that can be a very um, confusing thing to see on the AEEG. So I wanted to just quickly um, go through one of the limitations of AEEG because people oftentimes ask what that might be, especially related to seizures. And number one is that very short seizures can be missed. So type in the chat, if you remember, I said, how many seconds is one line on AEEG? Do you remember what I said? How often it gets plotted? Every 15 seconds, exactly. So if it's only a 10 second seizure, or even if it's a 45 or a 50 second seizure, it can be missed because the time compression is so um, small. The other thing is that there can be these artifacts that we pick up that are potentially like seizures. But I want to just challenge you that if, if these are the limitations, are they acceptable to you? Because if you don't monitor at all, how many seizures will you miss? And the answer is you will miss all of them or most of them, right? 80 to 90 percent of neonatal seizures are subclinical. So if we don't monitor, we won't see them. And even if we use video EEG, you should still be using AEEG because there are many hours in every day where video EEG is commonly not looked at at all by anyone. And so we need to be using AEG at the bedside and looking for these things right away. So just quickly, I'm going to have just a couple more hacks for you, and then I'm going to pass it back over to, um, to some of my colleagues. So number three hack is to mark events. And then if you are in the position as a provider, I implore you to review those events because marking them is, is really trying to help you and to tell you the story about what's happening with that baby. Because most of our AEEG monitors don't have video. And so telling the story is very important. So it may feel like double work to you at the bedside, but it's so important. So number one is to mark anything that looks like a seizure, to, to mark on the AEEG medications, and to mark changes, weird changes in the vital signs that might help clue someone in to a subclinical seizure. And so a lot of the devices have an ability to do this right on the, the screen quickly so that it's not too time consuming or to just use a pause or a press button um, that allows you to kind of trigger seizures on, seizures off, meds given, um, those kinds of things. But they're really important to, um, to do that. And ones that I don't think always get documented are things like I was mentioning, feeding, padding, and those cause huge amounts of artifacts. Okay, the, the number four hack is managing the sensors. And if you are a bedside provider, you know, and if you have AEEG or even you worked with full EEG, you know what a massive amount of work that is to manage the sensors. There's also, when you first begin your AEEG program, the, I, the question of who should place these sensors, when will we place these sensors, where to put the sensors, and even how to place the sensors. So we're really lucky now, you know, I've been teaching AEEG for almost 15, 16, ah, 16 17 years now. There weren't as many options available. There were needles, there were cups, there were sticky hydrogels that didn't work very well, but there are so many new cool tools out there that really pre-measure for you, are pre-gelled for you, are much more stable and secure and safe, um, but really there are pros and cons to all of them, and I would just um, encourage um, you to you know, investigate and evaluate them and figure out which ones are best for your department. When you're taking care of a baby with the sensors on, 
it's really important, especially if you're not using one of the pre-measured um, tools, the caps, is to make sure that the sensors stay symmetrical, stay separated, and are never ever touching. The closer they get together, the lower your, your pattern will look. It will almost look like the baby has one of those really awful patterns. And if they get further and further apart, the pattern looks really weird and wide. So you need to keep them symmetrical around the head. So equal distances um, and be able to, um, to, to do that. And I think the caps are a really um, great way to do that with that pre-measured um, tool. So here's a puzzling AEEG that I just wanted to show you because this kind of illustrates why it's so important to make sure that you um, have your sensors spaced correctly. So here on the left side, do you notice, and you can tap, type in the chat, do you see a difference between the left and the right? Which one looks normal? Just type in there which one you think looks normal and which one you think is abnormal. Let's see what you guys are saying. Yeah, the right one looks normal, right looks normal, bottom looks normal. Yeah, exactly. What was happening with this baby? Well, I went to the bedside and then look what happened. The sensors were touching. And so we separated them. The impedance was still good. And look, it was a miracle. The baby went back to having this beautiful symmetrical pattern. But being able to look at the left and right sides showed me right away that there was something wrong. And I was hoping it wasn't the baby had had a stroke. I was hoping it was really a, you know, a mechanical problem. So the fifth hack I wanna give you is to use your AEEG often. So when we don't use our AEEG skills, we lose them. And so I really do want you to go back and look at your protocol. You need to be using AEEG far more often than just cooling. And the ACNS guidelines will give you some ideas and give you an, an international standard to be able to go back and say, let's look at how we're using our devices, even your full video EEGs. Are we staying in alignment with what some of the national um, standards are? The obvious babies are those hypoxic babies, those asphyxiated babies. The maybe baby, the ones who you're like, should we cool, should we not cool? Those are the ones you can be looking at. The cooling babies for sure should be monitored. Any baby who has suspicious movements, abnormal, weird, transient vital signs, recurrent apneas, we need to be thinking seizures and strokes on those kiddos. We need to be monitoring them. And there's a lot of not so obvious kids that are in your NICU every day. Metabolic babies, infected babies, withdrawing babies. Even hyperbilly, if it's very high, can have some, we know, cornicterus, right? It's a, a neurological injury that occurs. But in the way to there, there are some abnormalities we see on the AEEG. Cardiac babies. Those babies are chronically hypoxic and that affects their AEEG. ECMO babies, even some babies getting some medications, we should be monitoring them continuously. Um, courtesy of um, my colleague, Dr. Chris Van Mears at Stanford, when we were putting together the neuro NICU there, we came up with our top 10 and then our top 12 and then a top 14 list. And I would encourage you at your hospital to do the same if you've had a little bit of an inconsistent use of your AEEG. So we came up with our top 10, well, this is the 12 version um, list. I still call it in my heart, the top 10 list. Um, but we talked about how long should we be monitoring, what kind of monitoring, and whether or not we needed a neuro consult right from the beginning. And so um, I would just encourage you to go back and think about, are we only getting our AEEG out for cooling babies? Because if so, you're missing a big opportunity to really get good um, at AEEG. So just to wrap up, AEG is not new. It can be easy to read. I hope you would agree that even in that very short little time, if I ask you right now, what's a normal pattern? Should the upper margin be greater than, hopefully you'll say 10, right? And that lower margin should be greater than five, right? I think you'd see that it's not that difficult with a little practice to really get good at AEEG. It can be used with our terms and our preterm babies. There's a lot of mounting evidence on using it with preterms. And also it can help us with those subclinical seizures like I mentioned. It has limits. 
but it is absolutely better than nothing. And if that's what we're doing, we need to reevaluate and say, I think I get this AEEG idea now and we should be um, using it. So as I mentioned on my website, I do have a, an ebook that you can download. I'll put these codes and this, this link to, um, to that in the chat area. And, um, and I just invite you to download that um, so that you can get that for free. And I have like a little video series um, that goes through all of that. So I just wanted to make sure, because I knew that I would never be able to do this in 15 minutes, but very close, really close to 15 minutes. Um, but I would like to introduce my colleagues who will be um, speaking next and, um, and to just wave and say hello again. So um, next up we have um, Martina Lai and um, Greg, As Greg Asatero who are from a and Neuro and they are going to give us a presentation on the new a and Neo device. So Greg and Martina. Send it over to you. Okay. Are you able to hear me, Kathy? Yeah, you sound great. Great. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, and thank you uh, for joining today. And thanks, Kathy, for your presentation, as well as your ongoing <clears throat> education activities on neuroprotection and the NICU. Uh, I, after the session, I want to get with you. I, I, I want to see more about that Nutella and banana hack. That, that looked pretty good. <laughs> um, in the next several minutes, what uh, I hope to do, uh, Martina and Lee and I will give you a brief introduction to the newest neonatal brain monitor that's available to NICUs worldwide. The NEO system was first introduced to NICUs outside of the United States and then put into clinical use about a year and a half ago. And just this summer um, to US NICUs through our partnership with International Biomedical. Really the, the whole premise behind NEO is to simplify the use and the operation of neonatal brain monitoring for busy bedside clinicians and to optimize the level of clinical data that's provided to neonatologists and to neurology departments. Neo simplicity starts with the hardware, but in, in, we worked with some well-known neonatal clinicians in the United States and in the Netherlands to optimize what's needed from both a hardware and a software um, perspective. But let's start first off, and I'll share a little bit about the hardware. There are really just three components, main components uh, to the system. The first is the all-in-one um, fanless uh, touchscreen PC uh, and monitor. Um, and when we match this with the system software and the user interface, it's, it, what resulted was uh, a user interface that works like other modern touchscreens that we are familiar with in our everyday life. Second, and importantly, and Kathy brought up in her presentation a lot about artifact, and the research grade amplifier is a key component to the system because we looked at some of the older AEG monitors that were available on the market, and we noted that in some cases, there was an excessive amount of time required to address poor signal quality um, or electrode issues. So we incorporated the higher quality research grade amplifier to improve the presentation of data for interpretation. And uh, to Kathy's point, reduce the amount of time and effort needed to deal with um, noisy signals or higher impedance that sometimes can be associated with hydrogel electrodes. As a result, I, I believe um, that bedside clinicians will need to spend less time dealing with artifact and uh, high impedances. The next component is the shielded adapter, which allows the NEO to keep the amplifier actually closer to the actual monitor. So the amplifier then is able to be put up right here and connected to the adapter which would go over to the bedside 
And uh, because it's shielded, it uh, is, uh, does a, a really good job of reducing some of that artifact and some of those other noise sources that Kathy mentioned in her presentation. And of course, um, all of this is available with varying, varying uh, mounting solutions uh, dependent on your needs at your NICU. Another unique component that uh, NEO offers is our WaveGuard neonatal head caps, which are well suited for reducing the time required to connect the infant for monitoring. Um, and I think uh, Kathy had an example of this in, in her presentation as well. The caps come in five different neonatal and two infant sizes, and, and that uh, should be adequate to address the various sizes of infants that are cared for in your NICU. Because these caps are reusable, we're finding that they're particularly well suited in NICUs with access to reprocessing services for cleaning them in between patients. Um, and we're also working on a uh, more cost-effective disposable version, which uh, won't uh, be available until uh, 2021. But so, so that kind of gives a little bit of the, the hardware component part of it. In my remaining time, I'd like to um, give you a little bit of an understanding of why uh, or how the system's features make it easy to use. So to begin with, this is what's seen when the system is first powered up. Now, while this screen uh, is customizable um, and we would customize it for your NICU to only demonstrate or show the montages that you choose to monitor in your NICU, it does have the capability of monitoring a single or up to eight channels of AEG and EEG. And again, just to keep it simple, um, we, uh, upon installation, uh, we would just go through and only select the ones you want so that when you select the montage for that infant or the, the montages that you would want available, um, when you select the montage, um, it would go then right into the monitoring. So in this case, I'm gonna choose that two channel montage and it's gonna immediately take us to the impedance check screen uh, to verify that all the electrodes are um, connected and have good impedances. So once they are all green, um, or if they are all green, assuming they're all green, um, and the impedances are good, all you need to do then is to select the start record button. And this is an example of the AEG screen or the screen that's presented to bedside clinicians. The purpose of this screen is to present the trend data, the AEG trend data, in order to spot significant changes in this uh, infant's background brain activity. Like Kathy said, if there was a seizure or if uh, an electrode came off, any of those issues, the idea then is to present it quickly and easily to the bedside caregiver. When a change does occur, um, similar to, or to address what Kathy suggested, when a change does occur, then you would select the uh, AEG, EEG split screen, and you'd be able to then get a look at what the underlying EEG looks like, uh, and also to use that um, for troubleshooting should there be um, artifact-related uh, um, EEG, and the um, AEG would reflect that up here. You would be able to go back in and take a look at that and quickly determine if this is a clinical or artifact uh, caused. So the last screen is an example of what the, how the monitor could be configured for your NICU to provide neurology with additional channels of AEG and EEG data should this be part of your protocol. So uh, as you can see in the screen, there's um, four channels of AEG above with um, eight channels of EEG shown down below. So hopefully that gives everyone a good overview of some of the ways NEO simplified uh, the use and operation of AEG for busy bedside clinicians and also 
through the use of the higher quality and channel count amplifier, how it optimizes the level of clinical data that's provided to neonatologists and the supporting neurology departments. I know it's been a lot of information thrown at you in a short amount of time, and I apologize for, I apologize for speeding through the highlights of the system. But I wanted to save some time for Martina Lee, who's a product manager for the Neo product, to provide you with a quick demo. And, and of course, your local sales representatives can set up a more thorough demonstration of the system following the webinar. Um, so Martina, at this point, I'll hand it on over to you. Thanks, Greg. As you mentioned, I'll be showing you a live demonstration of the software. And so this is the start screen that will display the protocols as he had shown. And he had an additional protocol in his screen, but as he mentioned, you can customize whichever protocols your NICU uses. Um, normally, I'd use my finger to select the protocol, but here I'll use a mouse so you can see the cursor. And I'll be selecting two-channel protocol. And once we've selected the protocol, we're now entering the impedance check to confirm contact with the electrodes. Um, this is where the leads for either hydrogel or gold cup electrodes are connected to the breakout adapter. If using the waveguard head cap, this is when you would start to insert the conductive gel. Um, so each circle here represents an electrode and the color in the middle denotes the impedance level. So red, uh, which is an INF right now, and infinite is a high impedance level. Yellow is medium and green is low. And so I'm gonna start um, with the ground and the reference electrodes. And then as I hook up the system to a data simulator, you can start to see that the middle circle of each electrode turns green. And that means we have fantastic impedances. They're all at zero kilo ohms. And because of NEO's high quality amplifier, it can maintain signal quality with higher impedances which make it easier, particularly for hydrogel electrodes. And so once the impedance levels are satisfactory, here they're all green, we can now start monitoring by selecting this record icon in the lower right-hand corner. Okay, so we're now presented with the main monitor view that displays the AEG. As Kathy mentioned, the first brush stroke or bar of AEG doesn't start to plot until 15 seconds of EEG have been collected. And so in the bottom panel, we have numeric indicators for burst suppression ratio, which quickly identifies whether the background pattern is in burst suppression, and the interburst interval, which is a telling you what the duration or average time between two bursts. And this is, this is something that would decrease as you go from preemie to a term uh, patient. And so it's thought to reflect uh, the infant's brain maturation over time. You can use these arrows in the middle to toggle between seeing the AEG and the EEG view. And then you can also toggle to see just the EEG view. Okay, and if you wanted to see something that was of interest in the AEG, uh, much like how Kathy was showing with looking at a potential seizure event. You can select the AEG that you want to investigate further, and it will take you to that time point in the EEG. And this part I can't show with the cursor, but it is a touch screen monitor. And you can use common hand gestures to zoom in, zoom out, and then also scroll. So we're still monitoring the patient right now, but you can scroll back if you wanted to look at data that was previously collected. And so in addition, NEO has automatic artifact detection. You'll receive notifications and annotations or markers will be placed in the data if high impedances are detected or if non-physiological data is present. So for example, I'll remove one of the electrodes and we'll see a message. 
pop up and it's saying non-physiological data is detected. And because I have an open line in the breakout adapter, we're getting a lot of noisy data. So the annotations can be placed by selecting either from a list of a standard um, type of annotations that are color coded and they can be customized to uh, by the user which annotations they like to use. You can also select a custom annotation here um, by inserting some kind of text if you find there's one in the standard list. To register a patient, you would be selecting this patient icon down here in the lower right hand corner. And the patient record can be created before monitoring or during the recording. Um, patients previously entered would be listed here. I have a lot of test patients. And selecting this plus icon will add a new patient record. And each field that has an asterisk next to it is required to be filled in in order to stop the recording and ensure that the data is correctly identified. So we'll return back to the recording here. And when you're ready to stop the recording, uh, you will need to register a patient before you end the recording. So I'll just select a test patient here. And then you can see now that the icon has the square stop uh, uh, button. And I will end it here. And yes, I will want to stop monitoring. This will take me back to the start screen. And if you're ready to power down the system, you would just simply select quit. And I think we're ready for the Q&A. Great, thanks Martina and Greg. And um, so for those of you who've been asking questions in the chat, um, we're just asking if you can put them all in the Q&A so we don't miss anything during the chatting. It gets, starts to um, you know, kind of get out of control so we can't always see them all. So be sure that you do that. And then um, we can just start going through um, some of, of those um, questions. So I'll just clear out a few of them. Um, I think maybe this one is a good one for um, Martina and to speak specifically about your device, um, about marking the screen and, you know, did, can you demonstrate that again, how that would yes. look for people um, and how they would maybe go back and review those? I think that's always really helpful. So let me um, just share my screen again. I can just go through and... Um, Sometimes it's easier to see in the EEG section. So if I wanted to select, let's say care, um, you can see here that there is this flag down on the bottom and it's green. And then if we were to go into the AEG section, you can also see there's a tick mark. Um, we may need some more data. There's the green tick mark. So that's that annotation that I placed for care. Um, same thing with the custom annotation, if you wanted to say here, padding. So there's some kind of motion artifact, possibly, then you can see that it's listed and it will pop up as a yellow marker, um, also on the AEEG. And if we wanted to review these, right now I'm reviewing while still monitoring. Um, you can... Let's see, it might be easy. You can just select in the AEG. Usually you can just click on the markers of interest and it will take you to that same timestamp in the EEG and you can see the annotation in the EEG as well. Did that answer? Was there anything else that uh, they wanted to see? No, I think, yeah, they're saying thank you there in the chat. So I think okay. that was exactly, yeah, because I had mentioned how important it is to mark those events. And so I do, um, sometimes people wonder how easy or how complicated um, that may be to, to do that um, for sure. So that was great. great. Um, let's see, is anyone using this now um, for daily monitoring? What changes are being made? 
Um, is this mainly a seizure differentiator versus normal behavior? Great um, question, Cheryl. Um, so definitely um, in that list of patients that I, I gave you, so some term baby conditions, some preterm baby conditions, um, there are many units um, around the US as well as in the world um, who have been using this as a daily tool. And, um, and daily just meaning, I shouldn't even say daily so much as continuous. So, you know, depending on how long you've been practicing, you probably remember when we used to just get spot EEGs on babies, you know, we'd roll it in, have 45 minutes, they would never misbehave while we were, um, you know, screening them with the full EEG, and then, you know, they go off and along with their, um, you know, the routine. And we would always wonder, are they really having seizures? Or are they not? So the ability of these easy monitors give you that access for 24-7, first to start it when you want it. And then second, the thing that I love about it is that you can see the changes happening in real time based on the clinical behavior of the baby, other things we may, doing, we may be doing with their management. And because it's an easy maintenance and because it can be easily placed, you can leave it on for days and days and days and days. And that's why it's recommended to use some sort of monitor like this, especially during cooling, because we can see background changes happening, which may indicate that the brain health is improving and that the cooling is actually doing something really powerful for the baby's brain in that moment. And, and so we can actually see those changes happening in real time. So um, I would just um, go to the ACNS guidelines that I mentioned, look through that list that are very fully researched on the different indications, and it is far beyond cooling and far beyond seizures. It's really looking at brain function and whether or not maybe an IVH or post-ventricular or um, post-hemorrhagic ventricular dilatation is actually having an effect on the brain function. Uh, cardiac babies who are chronically hypoxic, we can oftentimes see changes in their background activity um, and, and maybe help us, in addition to NEARS, manage those babies um, you know, a little more aggressively. So definitely um, important a tool to use day by day and especially to fill those gaps if you work in a place where you can't always get video EEG. Um, it would be really valuable. Martina, would you have anything to add to that? Or Greg? Um, at least for the NEO system, we, we just received FDA clearance earlier this year. And so uh, they're, they're just at the beginning of um, having NICUs that are interested in the system. But it has been introduced in Europe and also parts of Asia and the Middle East. Um, so we have been installing systems for the past two years. Great. Um, Crystal's asking what the hat is made of that you have. So the, the head caps have a double layer that is a sweat wicking um, breathable fabric. And then uh, the electrodes themselves are silver silver chloride bead and there's a silicone ring that's surrounding that bead. So when you do insert the conductive gel, you're not getting that gel to spread and um, potentially bridge with another electrode or, or contaminate the signal. Um, and so those are the materials. Great. And then do you still put the gel, the conductive paste and gel through those little holes? Or can you talk maybe a little bit more about that? Yeah, I so- I have a question. So the caps themselves, there is, you would start with um, placing the cap onto the patient. And then each electrode, there is a little hole at the top. It's inside that little ring that shows the electrode position. And you would insert the gel from the top and make sure you're making an electrode or a conductive gel bridge between that electrode bead that's in that silicone ring and touching the scalp. Um, and so that's, um, that's basically how you would um, start the recording after the, the gel is inserted. Awesome. Let's see if there's some other... Um... Um, so good question, and maybe um, I can answer clinically and you can answer technically. Um, issues of using multiple monitors on the head at the same time. So if you've got NEARS running and AEEG or full EEG, what are, what's your thoughts on that? Um, so FNEARS, uh, cerebral FNEARS, and also AEEG or EEG combined is, is quite common. I think the main um, issue by combining those monitoring devices is making sure you use sensors 
that are small enough footprint just because the infant's head, you have so much, only so much real estate, um, and making sure that the signals, that the sensors are not touching each other. Um, another thing that for, in terms of application that you wanna make sure you um, notice is making sure that the devices are not giving each other artifact or electrical interference. Um, and so that, um, at least for NEO, as Greg mentioned, we have a shielding technology that's in the cables, which just means an additional layer of metal that helps with the signal attenuation and then making sure you're not getting artifact from another device. Um, and so the, it, it, it's, um, it's a quite common um, practice to have the two together. Yeah, and I would agree. Um, it's I think you kind of touched on most things is just making sure you've got that small footprint, especially if you're using mirrors, um, which, you know, is going on the forehead for the most part. And, um, and, and doesn't tend to get into the location of the more kind of pared down limited channel AEG, which is more central and parietal. And um, so, yeah, definitely you can use them together. I think they're an amazing complement to each other. And there are several papers recently published about using them in different populations um, from preemies all the way up through um, cardiac babies, ECMO babies, um, and others. So I would look out for just kind of those um, com combined monitoring. So that really that multimodal approach to monitoring um, AEEG and, and EEG is great for, for um, function, but it doesn't tell you much about the perfusion and, um, you know, the oxygen saturations that are actually maybe contributing to that function. So using them together um, along with your other vital signs are, are really valuable. Um, and there's a, what I say, um, Tarek, you're asking, is there one that's better? Uh, it's hard to say. I think I would, if I only had my choice of one, I would start with NEARS for that population. And if I saw any um, decreased cerebral saturation, um, well, and you're saying during surgery. So for sure, NEARS during surgery, there are several studies. Um, we've done two or three at Stanford, um, pre-op, intra-op, and post-op for um, kids getting Norwoods. Um, uh, Donna Goff, who's a, a neonatal cardiologist that was at Loma Linda and now in Houston um, is very interested in AEEG pre-op, intra-op, and post-op for cardiac babies specifically. So her last name is G-O-F-F. -F. I would definitely look up her work. Um, she's got some amazing AEEG and long-term outcome in that population. So during surgery, you're really concerned about that perfusion, but AEEG is a, can be a surrogate for that. But I think if you've got a cardiac kid NEARS, and if you have the capacity, NEARS and AEEG, you will see many of those babies up to 20% will have abnormal AEEGs, either, either ba especially background disruptions um, early on, and then for sure disruptions of sleep-wake cycling. Um, so, so great questions there. Um, Carolyn, give me a time check. Should we transition or do we have time for maybe one more? Can answer one more question then? We can okay. go to your presentation part two. Sure. Um, okay, so it looks like, um, oh, this is, I'm, now I can't pick, now I have to pick one and now I can't pick one. Um, but maybe we can come back at the end. I won't mark these off in case we have some extra time. Um, what about CPAP with your cap? We've, we've, we've had this done in a NICU and um, I think Barrett has a video of it and we didn't find any interference, but we had to double check. Um, yeah. And it was um, first tested on, of course, on a, on a model. Excellent, excellent. So I'm gonna save these other two, um, Nellie and somebody was just asking, um, well, maybe you quickly can answer this one. Cap working with babies who have molding. With molding, could you tell me a little so more? So the little, you know, so yeah, so if they they have an abnormal head shape but no edema, that's one thing, right? But if it's you know kind of misshapen head and a lot of edema, what would you say to that? Um, I would say so. There's six sizes. Um, the best thing to do is to measure the head circumference and uh, making sure if there is at risk for edema, um, if it's a, if if it's a low risk, then I would say pick maybe a size that's one size larger, mm -hmm. just in case. Um, but with a wide range of sizes, I think there's a good fit for one. Great, great. Yeah, and, and edema is tricky because it's fluid between, remember, we've got the brain, 
We have the skin, we have the electrodes, right? We have skull, skin, electrodes. And anything that's between the brain and the electrodes and pushes those away are potentially going to dampen your signal. And that's going to happen whether you're using AEEG or full EEG. So it's not a limitation or a like a problem because it's AEG. It's just that the kiddo's head is so big and boggy that we just can't even read the signal. And probably the cap actually um, is probably quite nice because it's able to maybe even hold that electrical, um, the sensors a little closer in and not always get so pushed off. Um, so I don't know if that's, if you've seen that happen, but I think having that nice secure cap could be in, in a, a, a benefit there. Um, great. Greg, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, you know what? Uh, well, uh, afterwards, if there's more questions, we can Sorry about address that. it at that time. That's fine. You didn't jump in there. Sorry. That's okay. Martina's uh, got, got this uh, well handled. I don't need to. All right, cool. All right. Well, then, um, thank you, Greg and Martina. Um, um, I think Carolyn will stop sharing your video. And then we're going to jump into part two. And I know some of you are super excited about bingo. So let's just talk about when that's gonna happen because some of you are super excited. So on the paper that you got, um, so I know Carolyn posted it again. So if you don't have this, do not worry, but you do need the words. So somehow we gotta get you the words, but I think Carolyn, you have this uh, link to this, right? So basically you are gonna be taking the words at the bottom and randomly writing, choose as many as fits in here. And then at the end, we're gonna call the words and then you guys can win bingo. So some of you are already playing bingo, which is great, which means you're paying really close attention. So I love that, but it's um, not quite yet bingo time. So go ahead and get your bingo square. If you don't, I guess I just should say get your bingo square because Carolyn just wrote it there. If you don't have a printer, some of you might be in places you don't have a printer, that's okay. Take a piece of paper, make a square, and just make it five by five. One, two, three, yeah, five by five, and just make a square, give yourself the freebie in the middle, and then just write the words in. So you don't have to have it printed, but you do wanna know the words because you wanna know which words we're gonna call. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. So. Bingo is coming, don't worry. Um, I know you guys are excited. Okay, all right, so next we're gonna transition to another really important neuronicu topic, which is temperature. And you may think, really, Kathy, temperature? This seems really boring. Well, I hope you're gonna not say that, number one. But number two, I hope that you will really, by the end of this, appreciate how important temperature really is in neuroprotective care. And whether that's our um, you know, day to day kind of care. So I'm gonna just dive right in and um, hopefully you guys will um, stick with me and then we're gonna have another presentation on the uh, Tico Therm and then we'll do some more Q&A and play bingo. So again, don't go away. Don't go anywhere, stay here. All right, so let's talk really quickly about trends that we see over the years in neonatal um, thermoregulation. So many of you, and type in the chat how many years you have been in the NICU. I wanna see how many years you've been in the NICU because some of this you're gonna just like maybe have a little PTSD about and some of you are gonna say like, what the heck? I've never even heard of any of these things. Okay, awesome. So I'm seeing all the years. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm so excited. So 20 years, 25 years, nine years, 32, 30, 30. Ah, oh my God, 39. I love it. 36. Okay, perfect. Um, so you guys have been doing this, many of you, for a really long time. So what I'm going to do is talk about stuff that we used to teach all the time. And then I'm going to kind of like give you the 2020 version of this so that you um, – you kind of feel like maybe we've stepped it up a notch in 2020. So this is a little bit like the evolution of the cell phone. And so some of you were not even alive when the one on the very far left was really a thing and quite a status symbol. So if you had the phone that looked like on the left, type in the chat, oh yeah. 
or something like that. Um, if you had one of these original OG cell phones, yeah, they're like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, for sure, right? Many of us did. Um, all of us have cell phones today, right? So really, when we talk about the old school way of talking about thermal reg, it's really talking about neutral thermal environments, but we're gonna talk more about the targeted temperature management, which is the new 2020 way to talk about it. So let's go back to kind of the old school. When we thought about neutral thermal environments, we were really talking about that optimal temperature, the environment around the baby, which then allowed the baby to have minimal oxygen and caloric consumption. So we all remember, and probably you still see this little curve that shows this thermal neutral zone. And that when we get on either side of that, we have massive metabolic demands that occur to us. And on both extremes, we can have death. So the, the big old school way of thinking about this was, um, to allow them to, or to allow us to actually um, stop having, sorry, somebody is like on Zoom calling my phone. That's so odd. Um, preventing hypothermia and hyperthermia. So that keeping the baby in that neutral thermal zone. And we have tried many things over the years to keep babies in this neutral thermal zone which um, I'm gonna share a few with you. And some of you who may have never seen this and some of you are gonna be like, oh yeah, I remember that. So one of the things I think that has revolutionized um, the NICU is the concept of kangaroo care. And we have found that there are so many benefits of skin to skin mother um, kangaroo care. Uh, there are things like infection, um, prevention, microbiome transfer, you know, better immunity, better vital signs, better weight gain, better brain growth. But the reason it was actually conceived of was really to decrease mortality in Colombia, where they did not have incubators. And they had small babies and they just honestly were like, you better hold your baby or he's gonna, die. He's gonna freeze to death and die. So that is really how they invented it. But we know it is so powerful beyond thermal regulation um, for things that we're not even gonna talk about um, today. So the other real trend that we, especially as we started saving smaller and smaller babies. And so late nineties, when we started giving surfactant and babies who were very small were um, surviving, this, this uh, need to be able to control transepidermal water loss became very important. And so although I think it's just kind of what we do, we still should remember what a powerful um, evaporative loss this is and what a devastating metabolic it can have um, on babies. They can lose several hundred um, grams per day. Um, they can lose several um, hundreds of calories per day just through that loss. And so that's why we have created the kind of environments that we have now. So some of you um, probably would remember when we used to admit every baby directly into a radiant warmer and we would care for them for their, their first week of life because they were gonna blow a pneumo and we needed to have really good access and we just wanted to have access, right? And so um, I'm sure some of you are like, yep, that, yeah, Janice, yep, we remember that. Um, we just put them out on there. We use little tents to try to, like once we kind of understood, thanks to Carolyn Lund, transepidermal water loss, we would give these little tents and we would, we can tell you horror stories. Those of you who have not lived this, um, of trying to keep these kids warm, um, we would have, we would call them French fry lights or, you know, radiant warmer lights. We would have all these lights on them. We would be sweating to death. Our hair would be on fire. And, you know, it was really challenging to, um, yeah, take care of these kids. And tons of saran wrap, exactly, Anne. And you can see here, this is a kid who's being nursed in a open warmer, intubated, very tiny baby. Um, this was a tiny baby I found online from uh, Japan where 22 weekers there are commonplace to be in the NICU. And so we would bring the sidewalls up and we would strap saran across these babies. And sometimes we still do it even for cooling babies, but um, saran wrap it, you know, blankets, we would just wrap their extreme. I mean, we literally had saran wrap in the clean utility room and we would go get it. And then came along Aquaphor. 
aquaphor. Do you remember this? The slippery baby. And then if they were under phototherapy, we had to wipe it all off because they would get burns. And I mean, all of this stuff. And then they got candida, right? Oh, we all love what NICU nurse and RT does not have a bottle of aquaphor still in your bag because we all got you know, addicted to aquaphor when we had it in the unit. And even before it was in these, uh, in little individual tubes, aquaphor used to come in this big container like this. And we would use sterile tongue depressors and like scoop it out. Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine? Um, yeah, we used to do this to help because what Aquaphor did was put this barrier on the baby's skin. We even put tegaderms all over babies trying to give them a, a barrier because they were out in these open environments and we would just be really um, have a hard time. Then along came humidity, right? And we could have these trays that we used to fill and, and similar to what we do today, but not nearly as cool and clean. Um, these were literally water baths that actually just kind of heated up and then steamed. So it was like a little bit like a steam sauna. And we really couldn't control that humidity very well. And, and it felt like when you would open the baby's doors, you would always feel like this. And still, I still feel like this a little bit when you've got really high humidity, right? But along came, um, oh, the other thing I wanted to, to show some of you are these porthole covers. Who remembers porthole covers? The most disgusting fomites of all time um, because we wanted to keep all that humidity that we've just generated inside. And so we'd have to change these porthole covers and you know, it, it was really, really, um, and a pain to put them on and a pain to take them off. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we've come a long way in, in how we manage these little ones um, today. How many of you are having PTSD over the NTE chart? Do you remember this? Some of you will never remember, will never have even seen this. There is an ideal incubator temperature. Um, and the range to actually keep babies in range. And we used to have to look it up and we would then dial it in. Can you believe it? Yes. Oh my God. People are dying and crying. Okay. I love it. So this is the old way, right? This is the things we did. And of course, now we want to follow NRP guidelines. We want to follow those stable guidelines. There are lots of new things we're doing, right? The Cochrane Review from 2018 definitely established that you know, polyurethane bags and wraps and mattresses all do, and hats, they all work in the delivery room to help us, especially with those kiddos right after delivery. We also know that by adding some of these things together, we also can put the babies at risk for hyperthermia. So now we're doing such a good job that we are making them super hot. So how do we then, you know, move forward to this next generation? Um, oh, I, the other thing I just want to say was about hyperthermia is, you know, of course, using servo control. You know, back in the day, we used to set that air temp and we didn't really have servo. We didn't have that skin to control or those smart modes that would then titrate really nicely the temperatures up and temperatures down. And of course, now today, we do our best to always avoid that manual control. But that was really the way we, we used to, you know, going to give the baby a bath. I better turn up the incubator by about a degree. Okay, you know, the baby's going to be cold. Um, so we do want to really focus on that preventing hyperthermia. And servo controlled devices are your best friend. And so Tim's going to show you some more about um, that in a little bit. Um, I thought this was funny because this graph, because... In Australia, this was what I found on one of their um, nursing websites. You have a baby who has thermal uh, thermal reg instability, and then they have all these different reasons why preemie admission requires humid humidification on on high frequency, and then it tells the nurse which bed to go and grab. I was like, oh my gosh, this is what happens when you don't streamline. Um, you know, what, what you have in your unit. But I just thought it was hilarious. And really, for most of us, these beds that convert were really a game changer, um, where we could, you know, get access when we needed it. We, you know, we, but then we could close the baby up and we could do as much as possible inside the incubator for as, as, for as long as possible. So now we want to talk about targeted temperature management. And so this can be hyperthermia, which I'm, you, I know you're saying, what the heck? I know it kind of blew my mind. Hypothermia and normothermia. So I want us to get rid of that old wor world thinking of NTE and really think about normothermia as being a target and being also as therapeutic as some of these other things. 
So what I found was interesting is there's actually a discipline of thermal medicine. Now, the only kind of thermal medicine I really want is this kind of thermal medicine here on the right where I'm laying on a beach and I'm hot and, you know, I'm drinking something cold. And so I'm looking out at a beautiful, you know, sunset. That's thermal medicine to me. But it is actually a true art and a true discipline in medicine. And it's the use of manipulation of body and tissue temperature for the treatment of disease. And it can be traced back to very early practices and around the world. And just, I'm not gonna spend any time really on it, except to say that there's actually a journal called International Journal of Hyperthermia and Thermal Therapies. And the way they use hyperthermia, it's actually quite interesting. Um, I only did a tiny bit of reading about it, but it's about cancer treatment, particularly in combination with radiotherapy and thermal um, chemotherapy. So maybe some of you have been exposed to that through um, some of your clinical work. Um, there's actually this thing called heat activated drug delivery where they give you a drug and then you have to warm the temperature up and then it's like nanoparticles that then burst out and then can give a more targeted um, delivery, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. And so it can be more sparing of normal tissue. <clears throat> excuse me, and then thermal ablation, which probably most of us have heard of before with things like, um, you know, cardiac ablations for arrhythmias and things like that. So thermal medicine, not something we do in the NICU, but I thought kind of interesting in the grand scheme of all kinds of um, thermal medicine. So the last little bit is, of course, our induced hypothermia, and we want to make sure that we're not missing this, and Tim's gonna talk more about this in just a second. Um, but when you think about induced hypothermia, those of us who only work in the NICU, you know, kind of think it's the only place it exists. But in this particular um, paper, it looks at all of the different um, published papers over the last decade. And you can see that it's being used not only for HIE, but for cardi you know, post um, hospital or outside hospital cardiac arrests, um, TBIs, meningitis, liver failure, lots of things it's being used for. Um, we just think about it in the NICU for babies with HIE. And of course, cooling and the therapy of giving um, therapy or a cooling therapy is can be different degrees depending on what you're going for. If it's whether or not you're actually having cardiac surgery and they're giving you extreme hypothermia or whether it's a treatment like what we do, um, trying to keep babies in a very specific zone. And there are um, also things we should be thinking about with rewarming, there are also um, risks that can occur. So as a very quick review, um, so most of you have been practicing during, during and while cooling has become kind of state of the art. And so in the late 90s, we started doing um, these different trials around the globe. And you can see here, um, there, there's a list of trials, how many babies were included, the different ages, mostly greater than 36 weeks. When you add all the trials together, there were actually only about eight babies, I think, that were um, in the less than 36 weeks range. And I'll talk a second about that. And the different modes. There were only two that were um, selective head cooling. The rest were whole body cooling. And some of them initiated on transport, which is very important. And pretty much all of them had the same um, type of target temp. So if you look back at the meta-analysis that was um, published back in 2012, after all the trials had closed and we'd had the five-year outcomes, um, you'll notice that on the forest plot here that you see that when we combine all of these together, most of them um, don't even cross the zero line, meaning individually they were all statistically significant, but then pooled together, um, definitely uh, using hypothermia for babies with moderate to severe HIE, definitely reduced death and disability, both of those. And even if we look into childhood, um, we can see from the Toby trial, from Azapardi's work, as well as from the work from NICHD with Sitha Shankaran, that those um, improvements, they were sustained into, until childhood. You see things like a reduction between the hypothermia group and the control group for things like cerebral palsy and also for um, IQ and survival. So um, not really any change after they make it out of the NICU, really no effect on death um, so much. Um, but definitely on some of the other um, neurocognitive outcomes. So really the standard of care for us today is that to provide that 33.5 for 72 hours before the sixth hour of age and for babies who are greater than 35 weeks. And what we want to do is also re recognize that we have looked at other ways of giving this. We've looked at can we cool them longer? Can we cool them deeper? That was ca called the optimized cooling trial, and that did not show benefit. It actually had increased mortality. 
And we do have some future directions. We have medications like EPO, um, EPOGEN that are, are being investigated. Mild HIE, super hot topic. Um, there are many studies that are beginning to um, randomize control trials for mild, which won't give us the answer for another three to five years. Um, we've got the preemie cooling study, which is that 34 to 36 week study that's just finishing up and should give us some answers as well to some early outcomes relatively soon. And then we do have Dr. Laptuk's um, evidence around um, some modest benefit, not as strong if we do cool after six hours. And so some places are actually implementing that until 24 hours of, of age. Um, so there, there is still a lot to learn, but we are still, um, you know, trying to do as best we can. The thing I want to re remind you about is time is brain. And Tim is going to really focus on this. So I'm going to probably just breeze through a couple of this. But Mariana Thorenson and the group from Bristol have looked at these Toby trial babies for many, many years and have done the follow up. And what they're finding in this, and the title says it all time is brain, starting cooling within three hours improves motor outcomes, meaning that if we get it done sooner and we get to that target temp, sooner, there could be some extra benefit to that. The animal studies definitely showed we could show benefit up to six hours. But that doesn't mean we should wait till six hours or to five hours and 55 minutes. As soon as the baby qualifies, we should be cooling that baby. So the things that if you're doing cooling in your unit, the things to be looking at are time to target temp, time to start, and time that the baby stays in temp range, in that targeted temp. And I know a lot of you are doing passive cooling. This is the California data that we looked at in 2010. And you can see from the scatter plot that when we do passive cooling, kiddos are all over the place. And I think Tim, Jim's gonna show you some um, similar data to this. This is Virginia data showing just you know temperature um, on transport, like when you arrived at the hospital and when you got back to the unit. Um, we're all over the place with passive cooling. And so that's why in California, we did the California uh, transport cooling trial using the Tico Therm to really ask whether or not servo control A could be done because we needed a lightweight device. In California, we oftentimes have to fly. Um, and could it be done and could it be done um, well? And this is just a quick, um, sh to show our 100 babies who we enrolled and randomized, 49 to the control arm, which would be just standard of care, whether that was passive cooling or no cooling, or to the device arm. And what we showed was that these babies would quickly get to target temp within 44 minutes was the average. And that especially for short runs, it really helped us out a lot. And that the babies were able to get there and stay there. And that was really important. And all of that was statistically significant, um, you know, to the degree of 0 0.0002 and less than 0 0.0001 p-values. So reaching target temp and staying there, not bouncing all over the place, that was done by using a servo-regulated device. And so transport teams around the world have implemented this. And so I love this data that comes out of the UK showing on the left in 2011, how many places were doing passive cooling. And in just three short years, they made that switch um, to servo control. And that was really because the TicoTherm was available in that market and they could use it for all of their um, transports. In the US, we had to wait for that FDA approval. So just to wrap up, I just want to, again, emphasize how important, important normothermia is. Remember that neutral thermal zone, although it's old school, it has a lot of benefits. So just like Goldilocks, right, we want to just stay just right. And especially for our HIE babies, if they are a baby who doesn't qualify or who just is identified too late to be cooled, I want you to focus on Dr. Laptuk's work again, where he looked at elevated temperatures in babies who didn't get cooled. So remember, before we knew cooling was, was safe, we had a control arm of babies who just got standard of care. So we could look at them as a separate group. And what they found, and I bolded it for you, was that for every degree increase in their median esophageal temperature, there was a 5.9-fold increase for death. And same for outcomes, that increase um, in, in temperature every degree also showed worsened outcomes. And not just death, which is a very bad outcome, but also um, really dangerous to their brains. So that normothermia for that baby's brain, even post-rewarming for those first 24 to 72 hours post-rewarming, we need to really be careful with hyperthermia. Um, and he defined that as greater than 37.5, and he looked at the um, groups of babies that were at different levels. 
There are other risks, and I'm going to wrap up with these three really quickly for you. Number one, taking babies on transport is, is hard, right? And we have sometimes bad weather and cold weather, and some of you live in really extreme weather places. This group at um, Mercy Children's, and I would just um, recommend you check out this paper from 2019. It was really well done. Um, they looked back at their QI of temp of on arrival from transport, out, outbound, outbound um, transport. And they found that 52% of their babies were arriving hypothermic and they did a deep dive and they created an implementation plan and they reduced their hypothermia in one year by 17%. And with that, good on them that they were checking. They didn't have any extra hyperthermia, which I thought was awesome. And they identified a couple points in the care um, that was happening that they found that, that they thought were modifiable, the umbilical line placement, the cabin temp, which sometimes we cannot control, and whether or not they were using um, unheated and unhumidified um, oxygen or air supply or respiratory support. They have since met their goal of getting below 20% um, hypothermia on admission. They've dropped it to 10% and they continue to maintain it. So really hats off to them. They're at Children's Mercy and um, really great paper um, that they published about that. The other two places um, are, are part of one in the same um, paper, which I thought was really interesting, looking at the OR and looking at MRI. So they looked at kids when they left to go to surgery, and all of you probably can relate to this. Your kid leaves and they, or you take them and they have a good temp. They found the same, about 90% of the kids were at normothermia when they left. 24% of them were normothermic when, the, when surgery began, and then 40% were normothermic on return and very similar results to MRI. When they took the baby um, off the unit, 90% were within range, 43% normal thermic upon return. All of you deal with this. Really excellent paper, um, 2018 by, um, by uh, Don Paul here. And um, just to you know, kind of just say, again, these are places where we need to advocate for, high, for normothermia, therapeutic normothermia, avoiding all that cold stress for these kiddos and making sure that we're um, giving them you know, the best care we can. There are lots of options, especially for MRI now. We've got in-unit MRIs, we've got MRI incubators, and even taking our cooling devices which can be then used as warming devices while we take them to the, um, to the MRI suite. And we have these very long extension tubings that can stay out at the console and keep you safe. And I know Tim's going to um, talk about that. So to wrap up, I hope that I've taken you from the old school thinking of just neutral thermal preventing hypothermia to really thinking about temperature as a way we should be targeting um, a, a vital sign and a, and a therapy and, you know, for the, for the best of, for our babies. Um, so I'm going to pass it over now um, to my colleague and we're going to take it away on the TicoTherm presentation. So Tim Farmer is the uh, transport coordinator for St. David's and he's going to share his firsthand experience with using the TicoTherm that I've shown a few photos of. And then after this we'll do Q&A of everything so please keep your Q&As coming in. I'll check it while, um, while um, Tim's speaking and then we'll wrap up with our bingo so don't go away. We'll be, be right back. So Tim, take it away. Thanks, Kathy. So uh, my name is Tim Farmer. I'm the neonatal transport team manager for St. David's Healthcare here in Austin, Texas. And I'm gonna talk briefly just about our story incorporating the TicoTherm. Uh, not really gonna go too much over the how-to and the, the setup about it, but just basically our experience with it and what our current data is uh, showing us. In uh, 2014, we did a, another deep dive on our um, QI projects and the team really targeted our thermal regulation, kind of like that Mercy study that Kathy just referenced. And what is it that we could do to really level that out? And through all the, our different interventions over about a four year period, we eventually came to the ability to purchase the TicoTherm in uh, 2018. So you wanna put it here? Hi everybody. It's good to actually talk about something clinical and not have a face mask on. Uh, essentially, our experience with the TicoTherm has been, it's been very positive in almost every aspect. Uh, even from the initial education to the rollout, it's, it's as simple as turning it on, filling it up, setting your, uh, your constant mattress temp or your uh, servo control temp and just letting it run. Uh, the, low maintenance of it as far as if you're a standalone team or a unit based team the cleaning is very simple it's a basic two months just kind of rinse out 
the mattresses, the either disposable or reusable ones you can have. The disposables here are very soft and uh, work very well as far as our little securing devices here to keep the patient wrapped up. The other big issue that we always talk about too is the size and the weight. So this is a, you know, most transport teams always need to take everything into consideration their footprint. Uh, we really like the ability for the Stego to secure onto our tank module. And us being a team that uses ground rotor and fixed wing, every space is, uh, you know, very well thought out of and very purposeful. So incorporating the Tico Therm into our uh, thermal regulation program was uh, essential and being able to incorporate that to, in with the weight requirements and space was a huge uh, bonus for using the Tico Therm. Uh, as far as the interface is prepping it, it's very simple. Uh, behind me, you have it in constant uh, mattress mode. When we're actually in the servo control mode, when uh, targeting therapeutic hypothermia, it'll be green. And if it goes out 0.5 uh, greater, plus or minus, it'll alarm at you. So feedback from the team is if the, the rectal probe gets dislodged, it's very quick to tell us, hey, something's, gone, something's outside of parameters for us to troubleshoot, which is very important, especially when you're um, dealing with a very critically ill infant trying to get them to a higher level of care. Uh, during, during transport, what we kind of noticed too is things that we were initially concerned about, but turned out to not really be much of an issue is uh, when we are transferring from one power source to another, there is a brief disconnection in power, which will shut the Tico Therm off, but it being in that, uh, being able to maintain that constant mattress temp mode for the part where you go from a hospital to an ambulance or going from your ambulance to your rotor, even that space in between losing power wasn't enough to show any significant difference on our, on our patients as far as the um, skin temp and the rectal temp was measured. Uh, you know, whether or not you're a standalone team or a unit-based team, the other piece that we uh, looked into deeply when we incorporated the Secotherm was bedside report. If you're uh, transferring into a unit that is gonna be using a different device, then you need to really make sure that that SBAR, that bedside report, makes a, a firm line of when therapy was actually started. What we realized is that we were a team that was so used to doing passive cooling for so long that when we arrived, okay, when we arrive at the unit, that's when our therapy is going to be starting and we'll kind of go on from there. But when we incorporated the Tico Therm, we need to make sure we communicated with the bedside nurse that yes, the therapy has started two hours prior or an hour and a half prior and making sure that was a seamless transition. So for those of you that are using it in a complete uh, mode and actually have that uh, Tecotherm being used in the unit, that's, that's great. But for those teams that might not be at that unit or unit base or just dropping off at another NICU, making sure that that uh, communication was seamless and uh, has been a, a big benefit to take the extra time when rolling that out for your initial education. Another thing that we looked at too that we're really happy about is we did a lot of work with passive cooling at our referring facilities. So, okay, Patient's been targeted for potentially a therapeutic hypothermia. We're on our way. Do the, these types of interventions uh, maintain the patient's uh, temperature to, you know, to reduce the heat on your warmer? And sometimes patients would be a little too cold or sometimes patients would be a little too hot. For those patients that were a little too cold, what we noticed is that when we got there with our Tecotherm, we could slide that mattress right underneath that baby as we were preparing for stabilization and get that baby warmed up quicker to that therapeutic temperature. So that all kind of being said, I wanted to switch to a slide and show you some of our data that we collected. Okay, so on this one, we have uh, the green dotted line right at that 33.5 target. The blue and the orange, or the blue is going to be your passive cooling, and orange is going to be your active tecotherm cooling. What I did was I layered these over on top of each other to kind of show you the consistency that once we implemented the tecotherm. The, the, blue, lot, the blue dots were actually collected about 20, 18 to 20 months prior to our purchase of our tecotherm, and the orange dots were after we purchased our tecotherm, and I layered them on top of each other. And one of the main things I wanted to, to show on that one was that there really wasn't any learning curve. And we were a team that took a lot of pride in our ability to passive cool to the best of our ability. And we, I, I believe we were always doing a very good job. We were very conscious about it. But even with that, and with many years experience of passive cooling, you can just see right there really quickly, 
the consistency and that inability, that ability to maintain temperature quickly, these are all arrival temps. So from the time that we picked up the baby and these dots are when we arrived at the uh, higher level of care uh, to continue therapy. And that very first time we did it, we were spot on right at, at 33.5. A lot of things that we noticed too is that to kind of echo Kathy's uh, uh, research and the things that she was mentioning, that we got down to our 33.5 temperature pretty quickly. And we were able to still, while stabilizing the patient prior to transfer, we were able to get down within about an hour to 33.5. There's a couple of dots that were a little higher there were a couple of faster transports that we had done where we got the mattress in underneath the baby prior to departure. But for those ones that we actually were able to get the mattress on the baby prior to loading in during the stabilization phase, we were able to get them down well within under an hour. And when you took our total transport time, we were able to shave about two hours off uh, to therapeutic temperature total. So from the point where we were contacted, hey, we need to request a transfer, to making first contact with the patient to arrival. And when you put all that time together, we were able to shave two hours off that six hour, that six hour limit, that six hour mark that we were talking about earlier. Uh, you know, looking through more on that graph too as well, it's a lot about the stress reduction I noticed from a managerial perspective. When speaking with the team, using the TicoTherm allowed them to kind of set it, let it run, let it do what it, let it servo control and maintain that core temp while we can monitor other aspects of that patient too. Because if you have a really bad meconium aspiration patient with a lot of respiratory components too, potentially even incorporating nitric into that, trying to passively cool on top of that complicated kid adds a lot of layers of stress. And I, if I had to kind of compare it to anything, I would say the moment that the team did their very first transports, they came back so relieved they were pretty much dancing like Kevin Bacon in the movie Footloose. They were so excited. They're like, man, look at this. Stress has been reduced and we're able to focus on taking care of the patient in other aspects rather than just exclusively chasing passive, passive cooling, using adjuncts, not using adjuncts having that TicoTherm really made a huge difference. Well, you know, you fast forward a couple of years after using it, it was like, all right, this is great. We're, we've done a lot of thermal, thermal regulation work. Is there any other place we could potentially use this, uh, use this device? And when we look at our kids that were not cooling, we're just doing our intervention, kind of like that Mercy uh, Children's Study, we were able to get to about 90% of our patients between that 36, 5, 37 mark, 37, 5 mark, and who were the patients that we were having a hard time with and were they coming in warm or coming in um, uh, cool? Well, the majority of the ones that are coming in out of our range are coming just under 36.5. And the kids, when we actually look at them, they're actually our late, our late pretermers. They're our smaller kids. And it kind of harkened us back to the fact that you know, we're in our isolate and we don't have a servo controlled way to uh, adjust air temp. And our patients are, you know, being transported between different types of environments. And like you would think, right, it's in, the, it's in July, it's in August in Texas, it might be 103 degrees outside. Every single patient's going to be coming in probably hot, not cold. But that's just not actually the case. In an attempt to not overwarm our baby, sometimes we might just go a little bit on the cool side. So we've kind of talked to, amounts to ourselves as a team. This TicoTherm works so great with uh, our active cooling is, is really just created that solid line at that therapeutic goal. Could we possibly use it to keep our babies up to a, a normal temperature to kind of break through that, that lower kind of 36.4, 36.5 mark that we keep kind of finding ourselves in with some of these late pretermers. And right now I don't have a, we don't use it that way. I don't have any answers yet. Maybe there's some of you on this, uh, on this call that use the mattress on transport to maintain a normal temperature and not just for therapeutic hypothermia. And I'm I'd be excited to hear uh, your questions or your thoughts in the, in the open discussion. So uh, going from there, Kathy, you want to open back up to some, some discussion? Sure. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. That was really helpful, I think, to just put it really into easy practical terms of, you know, how to use it and, and just your experience. Um, let's see. Somebody's asking about um, your experience with getting the umbilical lines in and then the line, you know, doing the line placement and getting initiating cooling. Are you seeing any issues with clamping down or more difficulty for the t clinical team, you know, as you guys are putting that in place? Um, she's, this person saying they're, that their clinicians usually want to get the 
the lines in first before they start the cooling. Oops, can you hear me, Tim? Oops, he's muted. Tim, you're muted. It's, it's pretty variable. From the feedback from the team, it just really depends on where the transferring center is in the stabilization process and how much intervention this patient needs as far as line placement uh, prior to our arrival. If they're, under, if they're already sterile and in that kind of process, we'll typically find ourselves waiting. Mm -hmm. But it's not to say that if we can get there prior to and we've decided to place lines that we can get that going and get the rectal probe placed and uh, servo controlled. Because what we have found too is that we want to cool this kid and the patient's under sterile drapes and maybe we find out this patient was a little too cold Mm -hmm. uh, by the time we get our, um, our mattress underneath them. So yeah, that's a, that's a very, uh, it's a very common consideration. I think it's going to be relative to how far along the transferring facility is on their interventions. Yeah. Good answer. Um, so th there's a question about low resource <clears throat> um, settings. And I don't know if you, if you've done any teaching in some of um, areas, you know, in the Middle East or India, or um, even in Asia, you know, can, can hypothermia be done there? And what would be your suggestion for low resource places? I mean, we, based on our, on our data for being very, um, you know, very targeted in our passive methods, if you don't have a device that's gonna be able to servo control and actively cool, you know, really making sure that you stay very, very acutely aware of the, of the ups and downs and, developing a process of manually controlling or potentially using the servo control on your, on your skim temp, on your warmer. Just, it really is going to depend on uh, what passive equipment is these communities might have. But there, there's a process. Uh, we, for us, 33.5 to 35.5, if we can keep it in that range, we found out if you kind of look back at our data, you kind of see that's where we kind of wobbled. Mm -hmm. with a lot of active intervention and i feel like if your goal is somewhere between there that would be that'd be reasonable for passive and then active cooling would just be um whatever device you're using uh, and just making sure that it's functioning within its capabilities yeah yeah so it's it's a good question um to reckon and i guess i would look back um to those two there's two papers that used ice packs so the icer paper um ei um cer as well as the um, ICE trial, the ICE trial, which was published by Jacobs, which they actually ended early because they had already, um, you know, enough of the, the trials had come back as showing benefit, so they closed the trial. Both of those trials used ICE packs, um, but did what Tim said, which is very tight monitoring of the temperature. So um, you can look back through older literature that was published of, um, you know, water baths, of fans, of, you know, trying to do convection. There were several um, really powerful, um, well-powered studies in India looking at a fan power because, you know, in many situations, and I, I don't know exactly what country you're in, but sometimes just electrical power is inconsistent and um, you can maybe freeze those ice packs and not then need to worry about the power source, but you really must be diligent um, about about the temperature monitoring especially your severe babies they have a tendency to overcool themselves and that's what tim was saying like when they you arrive at a hospital and they're you know the kid's so sick everybody's already in action i mean these kids will overcool themselves so you you, you oftentimes we find that these the blankets are warm because these kids are trying to dump their temps um so you do need to really monitor temperature remember this is targeted temperature management. The therapy is the temperature. So getting the kid in range and staying in range is important. And that is the most important thing. You can find many tools to do that. It's just, you got to stay in range for that 72 hours. You need to identify them quick. You need to make sure that they're um, being really titrated um, powerfully. Um, kind of to, to echo that, based yeah. off our passive cooling on transport our set air temp is about 26 mm -hmm. and then we did we really did stay away from adjuncts i'm not saying we didn't always use them but if we did we cracked them and we didn't make direct contact necessarily with the patient we would kind of use it to kind of cool cool the air within the isolate 
Uh, yeah, now, obviously, depending on your resources, if you're trying to maintain that temperature for a long period of time, um, it's just going to be really just about about tracking and being really tight on your interventions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and, and, the, and the protocols are great. You can look them up. The old Jacobs ice trial would be the one I would do if, if you were wanted, wanted to follow something that was a published, a really well-designed study um, and protocol. I would go with that. Um, so, Tim, they're asking, can they use TicoTherm with esophageal probes, or is it only rectal? Well, we use ours with rectal, but we have also transported with esophageal probes, too, to kind of, kind of compare it. Uh, that's been our experience. There's also ability to put on a skin temp monitor mm -hmm. as well. But uh, it's, from, from my understanding, from my use, it's been servoed off the, the core temp from rectal. Yep. And um, what about that kid who has lots of meconium? Have you had any difficulty with the probe? Uh, I mean, with those, I mean, it's just basically monitoring to make sure it's not popping out and yeah. keeping it secure in there and making sure it's clean, the site as best we can. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it's just, what I like about the TicoTherm too is it's quick to tell you if something's wrong and you'd be able to, to correct that intervention really fast. And when we're comparing it with axillary temps and things like that on arrival, we're seeing it, it, it is doing what it's saying it's doing. It's and we've great. Kind of validated it that way. It's great. <clears throat> uh, let's see, there is a question about maybe using it in the operating theater. Um, so if you were gonna use it for normal thermia, um, would you use a core temp probe or would you maybe go with a skin temp probe? So, I mean, right now, so we haven't actually used that in, in that way on transport. I'm thinking that we'd probably use a skin temp probe, constant mattress temp, most likely, mm -hmm. and then monitor it from that. Almost kind of use it like a, like pretty much how you would kind of attack a, a 23 weeker as far as thermal regulation, that like using, yep. using a thermal mattress, but using it for some of our larger kids. That's what we're thinking, at least that's what we're discussing, talking with our medical control about it. But we're, we're pretty excited. We're feeling comfortable with it. And I feel like this might be a key to get us to break through that kind of 10%, mm -hmm. kind of like where Mercy Children's is at. I haven't yeah. read that, today, but we're, we would parallel their, their, um, their findings. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you wait to get a referral so that your MCP order is cooling after speaking with you? We'll be, we will be using this. I'm trying to read the question and understand it. Um, current uh, says to wait to set up your MCP orders. So I guess, like, how do you decide on when to start the cooling? So is that decision made um, pre your run or like before you guys go out? Or do you actually go there, do an assessment and then make the call for cooling? Depending on if it's going to be an in-network or out-of-network transfer and depending on where, what the relationship is with the physicians, if we go outside of our normal physician group into the more rural parts of Texas, the medical control, which is back at uh, the receiving NICU, is going to be the, the final call for us based on our bedside assessment. So the nurse and the RN will be there, communicate back with the physician, yes, initiate uh, active cooling and we'll do so. And I going back to your slides about those mild kids with the tico therm i feel like the neos are coming on to board you know all right we can do this we can do it safely let's 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 broaden our implementation of this because i think as the data goes towards these mild cases with this device it really gives us an ability to stretch out those um level three level four nicu uh, care to the rural rural community so yeah the mild stuff is really interesting for sure. Determined by the physician once communicated with from the transport team on site. All right. Well, I think we've come to the end of the um, Q&A. I think we still have a few more minutes and you guys are hanging in there for the bingo. I see that most of you are still here. So um, I'm going to turn it over, I think, to Mike and just, again, thank you all for sticking with us for this kind of, you know, different kind of a workshop and webinars. I hope you've enjoyed the content. And um, the conversations and maybe some of the memory lane and a little of the PTSD for some of those things we used to do. Um, but with that, I'll um, hand it over to Mike and the team. All right, thank you, Kathy. Uh, I'm Mike Fincher with International Biomedical, one of the regional managers. Uh, just turned over my 22nd year here. I'd 
hopefully retire soon, but not. Um, I've known Kathy for almost the whole time, over the 20 years, and it's we're really lucky to have a resource like her to help us out and everything. And uh, Kathy, thank you again for all your help. And Tim, our uh, 